Welcome to Victory Christian Center. You're about to hear from our senior pastor, Pastor Stefan Schlugel, as he brings a message on a Sunday service. And uh, so with that, uh, uh, the title of this morning's message is the same as last week. It's God's Established Authority Structures. Um, I brought a message last week that uh, if you didn't get to it uh, somehow, I'd really encourage you to get to it because it's typically what we do is if we have a series of messages, we lay the foundation in the first message and then we build on that. And it's all, uh, you know, if there is uh, you missed, missed out somehow, then I'd encourage you to get on our YouTube channel and uh, get to that message or otherwise pick it up on Spotify or various other uh, platforms. Um, uh, the subtitle of today's message is Understanding Authority and Its Various Applications. Understanding Authority and Its Various Applications. Now, last week, as I said, we laid a foundation. I'm going to do a little recap before we cover new ground. Uh, and last week was quite specific in, in terms of areas. Uh, when we looked at the book of Genesis, the book of beginning, the book of foundations, where foundations were laid, and so forth. And uh, uh, this morning, I want to do more of a holistic uh, approach to the teaching to cover, uh, I suppose, the, 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 the holistic sense of authority and how it all relates to us and how God expects us to, to respond to authority uh, and so forth. And, uh, and by the way, this is once again a discipleship message. That's all we do. We do discipleship messages. We don't just preach for the sake of preaching. We bring God's wisdom. Uh, and I'm thoroughly convinced that ministers of the gospel uh, that need to bring the knowledge of God to God's people so that we can lay a hold of it. And the Bible says, as we become doers of the word, we are blessed. Not hearing only, but doing and applying these things. And then things will work out better. Then our lives function better. Our marriages function better. Our families operate better. Uh, being able to make a living, all of that works better. Everything is better when we do God's word. And so uh, we want to bring God's wisdom again this morning and trust that that will bless you. Now, as, uh, by way of recap, we said that in the book of Genesis, uh, at the uh, account of creation, when God created the heavens and the earth, we see that God has set in place and communicated a certain authority structure. We might say structure or structures plural, um, and we said that this authority structure is still in place today. God has not canceled it. God has not superseded it with another idea or another method that is still in place today. And uh, the revelation that I shared last week is that a lot of people's problems in life goes back to not understanding authority and how to deal with it and how to respond uh, to it. Uh, and so uh, I want to reread again and Genesis 1 verse 26 uh, and verse 28, it says, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion. Here it is. God says, let them have dominion. Dominion means authority. Let them have authority over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, fill the earth and subdue it. Everybody say subdue it. All right, subdue the earth. Uh, don't worship the earth, subdue it. All right, some people worship the earth today. That is not God's plan. All right, he says, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So uh, just a series of statements to kind of uh, wrap things up where we were last week, and I'm not planning uh, to repeat much uh, from what we talked about last week because that was last week's message today. This is a fresh word, all right? This is fresh manner for today, all right? We said that God created mankind, and He gave us dominion. He gave us authority, and then he created and communicated an authority structure where God himself is the ultimate, the supreme authority over everyone and everything. All right. And then we said that God has delegated authority in the earth to mankind. For example, Psalm 115 verse 16, it says, The heavens, they belong to the Lord, but the earth has he given to the sons of men. Now, in that sense, we need to realize that we, we don't own the earth, we are stewards. Uh, over the earth, all right? We are managers uh, over the earth. And then we said that uh, 
And then God has delegated authority over the family or in the family primarily to the man. All right, when we say primarily, there's obviously the woman carries authority, the wife, uh, but God primarily has given the authority uh, in, in the home to the man. And we said that if something goes wrong in a family, God is firstly looking for the man. And we saw last week in the book of Genesis when things went wrong in the Adam's family and God came looking into the garden and he wanted to meet with Adam and Eve. But the first thing he says, Adam, where are you? He didn't say, Eve, where are you? He says, Adam, where are you? And uh, we said that whenever there is trouble in a home, it usually is there because of a disregard for God's established authority structure. And we said that uh, men, that's husbands, fathers, uh, they are the primary watchmen in their family. And we're using a word from the Old Testament where every city, every town, walled towns, they had a watchman up on the high point to watch out for danger, to watch out for enemies coming in. And if there were friendly people coming, they opened the door or the gates, uh, called down to the gatekeeper. Um, and then if there were enemies coming, he said to the gatekeeper, uh, close the gates uh, and keep the enemies out. And the man is the primary uh, uh, watchman but he's also the primary gatekeeper, all right, fulfilling two roles. Uh, and of course, praise God for all the praying that women do and women have done until men catch up and understand that that is a role that God has allocated to them. Um, and we said that men must guard every ent entrance into their home, into their family. And when we say entrance, it's not just the physical front door and the back door and the windows. We are now talking the internet is an entrance into your house, stuff that is brought into the house, movies and games and junk and stuff. It's like, you know, somehow don't let all of that ride and slide uh, because the enemy, as always, will try to wiggle his way into people's lives, into people's homes. And then finally, we indicated that the man is the chief servant in the family and responsible for its entire well-being. All right, and, uh, and that's a tall order, let me tell you. Let me tell you, that is a tall order. Uh, and praise God for women and the role that they fulfill, and praise God for men, the role that they fulfill. And uh, along with the privilege of having the authority in the family comes the responsibility. And if we don't understand the responsibility, a man that doesn't want to do the responsibility, then, you know, the privilege, uh, is, it's, it's just difficult, really. So it's good for us to understand these things. Now, this morning I want to, as I said, do a holistic overview over authority, uh, even start with the, with, with, what are we even talking about when we talk authority? Uh, so I want to give it, the word authority some definition so that we can really capture things and that we're all on the same page. I sometimes find I get amongst friends or I get even amongst ministers and then they talk about things and one's off over here and one's off over there and one means this and the other one means that. And I says, oh, I'm not sure if we're all having the same conversation. You're talking about something different to this person over here and everything. And so let's just slow down and say, when, when you say this word, what do you mean? Because he means a different thing. And there's like a missing going on. So we want to slow down and say, what is authority? Well, authority is the right to create and to enforce rules and regulations. This is just simple uh, dictionary definitions. I mean, there's much more there, but we want to just sort of clench it and then move on. Uh, authority is the right and privilege to operate at an elevated position or rank. Um, you know, it's been said that at the foot of the cross, uh, the ground is level that everybody is we stand before the Lord. We're all the same before the Lord. There is nobody higher or lower. We're all the same before the Lord. All right? But in society, there is an authority structure. In the family, there is a pecking order, uh, if we can use that expression. Uh, and we need to know what that is, and we need to know where we fit in into the overall scheme of things. Uh, so it is the authority is the right and the privilege to operate in an elevated position and rank. And having authority means that we are authorized to rule, uh, and we're using a Bible word, an Old Testament word, to rule, uh, uh, which means to influence, to lead within a delegated sphere 
or space. Um, and uh, all authority that we are dealing with uh, as human beings is delegated authority. Um, it has been given to us. Um, and, uh, and so we need to understand that. Uh, so, so it is that, uh, that sense that there is a, uh, uh, an, we are authorized to operate within a certain space and bring leadership, um, even create rules uh, and then enforce rules, whatever that means. Now, I don't want that to be seen as a sort of a heavy duty sort of a thing that a man walks around with a stick or anything like that. That's why we said earlier on, you see the man, the husband, the father is the chief servant in the family. He's not there to serve himself. He's there to serve the family. He does not make decisions that suit him the best as the man. He makes decisions that's best for the family. All right. Uh, and then uh, the word authority is dominion. And when we read in the Old Testament, we've just read before in Genesis, when it says dominion, it means authority. And then finally, you know, the word kingdom. Um, the word kingdom is used over and over in the Bible. What is the kingdom? Well, the kingdom has been defined as the king's domain. That's the kingdom. All right. So the king is kingdom. Uh, let me say it again. The king is king in his kingdom, not in everybody, everybody else's kingdom, in, in, in his kingdom. And then God has given us certain domains uh, that we are to bring leadership and influence uh, and so forth. So again, the word kingdom means the kingdom is the king's domain. Um, and, uh, and of course, we need to specify because people sometimes inevitably end up getting the wrong, the wrong end of the stick, so to speak, that to say that the man is, is, the, is in charge in the family, then, then some people think that, that every man is in charge of every family. Well, that's not the case at all. Uh, you know, he's the, he's the, he's the leader in, in his own family and in his own family only. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, that's why the Bible says in the book of Genesis, and again, that is a foundational thing. It says, for this reason shall a man, this is a young man, leave his father and leave his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And now you've got a new family, and there's a new kingdom, so to speak, uh, set up. And he leaves his father and his mother. He comes out from under their authority and sets up his own family. And some of you, when we're talking about authority structure, you are dealing with tribal authority structures that had never been placed there by God. They're a cultural thing. And there's another layer of complexity that's added to it and other pressures coming in and other commands coming from somewhere that God has never intended to heap on people. God says, leave your father and your mother but that's not to say that you never go back and visit. That's not to say you will continue to honor your father and mother. But when it comes to obeying, you see, children are commanded to obey their parents. But when children grow up, it no longer is an obeying. It is just an honoring, but not being under that umbrella for the rest of their ongoing lives and having another authority structure to deal with them. And there's already, you know multiple layers of authority, and each demands uh, a certain whatever. So anyway, that's about all I'm going to say on that. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, and others of you are not so sure. Um, letter B, that's the second heading, and it's in your outline. Uh, there's the different kinds uh, of authority um, or the different applications. Authority is authority, but there's different applications of it. And I've got a list of eight uh, spheres of influence um, where authority is operating. Uh, that's not that's all that came to mind. That's not necessarily a 100% exhaustive list, but I think it certainly hits the headlines. Uh, all right, so number one, obviously we've already discussed it, there is uh, God's authority, the ultimate supreme authority, that is God Almighty. And we've got some scripture references there in Isaiah 45. We won't turn to it, but just to say that God speaks to the people there. He says, I am the Lord, he says, and there is no other God besides me. And then he carries on. He says, I am the Lord. He says, and there is none besides me. And in fact, he says it three times. He says, there's none besides me. See, God is not part of a committee. All right. 
though we, are, we do understand that there is such a thing as the Trinity, and we will be discussing that in our you know, School of the Word, in our Christian Foundation course coming up. And, but other than that, God is the supreme and the ultimate authority. All right? Then secondly, there is domestic authority. We call it domestic because it relates to people's homes, their families, domestic authority. Uh, and of course, Ephesians chapter 5 uh, speaks about that extensively. It tells the man what his role is. It tells the woman what her role is. Uh, and it speaks there about the children uh, obeying their parents and so forth. It's well documented, uh, not difficult to understand. Then there is governmental authority. Um, and when we say governmental, meaning uh, that in our nation in New Zealand, we've got central government, uh, we've got regional governments, as in regional councils, that carry a certain authority, and then you've got local councils. So you've got central, regional, and local. Uh, in other countries, in other nations, they've got a federal government and a state government, and a, you know, it's sort of just different structures, but typically uh, it's what we call governmental authority. And again, uh, God tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, the scripture that's out the side here in, in your outline there, God tells us that we are to pray for these people, for kings and for all who are in authority, all who are in authority. Kings, politicians, prime ministers, uh, members of parliament, uh, uh, leaders over various uh, government departments and so forth, and of course, mayors and city councillors and so forth, pray for them. Um, and... Uh, and then uh, in Titus chapter 3 tells us that we are to submit to these authorities. Um, and uh, that said, I would like to put in a, what they might call a, a caveat uh, in the sense that it is not a blind submission to anything they do any more than what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego submitted to King Nebuchadnezzar when he built a great big statue of gold and he gathered all the people together and he says, as soon as the music begins to play, uh, we want you to bow down to the golden image. And everybody bowed down except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And when they talked to the king, they were brought before the king and they were accused of not bowing down. He was the government, remember. But what was going on here is what we might call today government overreach. You know, when government overreaches, I for one don't plan to bow down. And if they play a certain tune and a certain music, I do not dance to that music. All right? So that's what, what I mean by putting in a, a caveat in there. At some point, we might open that up and bring a specific message around all of that uh, because we see plenty of scriptural examples where they honored the government, they honored the king, but when the king demanded something, for example, in Egypt, when Pharaoh demanded that all the boys that were to be born of the Hebrew women, the boys were to be killed off the Hebrew midwives did not obey because that was what we call government overreach. All right, and we've had government overreach in our nation and in nations around the world. Just remember what happened two, three, four years ago. That's absolute government overreach. And without wanting to get into it, because if I do, I might not be able to get out of it. I feel very strongly about these things. Uh, they give themselves emergency powers and then they are doing all sorts of things. And it later on turns out that when courts uh, uh, and judges analyzed that a lot of that was just all illegal. But people bowed down and they danced to the music that they played. I'm not dancing. I'm, I don't want one of those face nappies on me. Thank you. I don't want that thing. Uh, and and uh, so, so that's why I'm saying that uh, we absolutely uh, need to understand that God's put, God put authority in place. But when authorities overstep, their role uh, and overstep their authority, as you can have in a family. You can have a man that is absolutely abusing his, his authority and steps beyond what God has allocated to him. And the same thing can be happening at all levels across society. Uh, and we live in a democracy, friends, uh, and let's fight to keep the democracy. Uh, it is possible to let it slip away. Um, and uh, in a democracy, it's power to the people, 
All right, praise God. Some of you are more enthusiastic about this than others. In fact, I might come and preach to these people over here. So governmental authority, number three. Then number four, you got employment authority, uh, meaning that in any place of employment, somebody's the boss, there is a company, there is a company owner, there is a government department or whatever it might be or some sort of a organization, there is uh, an authority there, uh, there is a manager, there is a supervisor who has been delegated authority over the whole company or over a department, uh, uh, over a particular section and so forth, and which just means that, means that there is authority there. Then number five, you would have what we might, what we might call organizational authority, meaning that, uh, that schools are not a company, but there is an authority there. All right, you have, uh, you have sports in the area of sports. You've got people that are leading uh, the proceedings. You've got, uh, what, what are these people called? The referees. Uh, they've got authority. Uh, they are there to, to, you know, to work with established rules and then to enforce them. And when the rules are broken, out comes the yellow card. And in some instances, out comes the, the red card. What is that? It's authority. All right. And the same thing, you got certain clubs. Uh, I belong to a few clubs uh, because I think it's good for me to be out on, amongst people and everything. And in every club, there's somebody that is leading uh, the show, somebody that communicates what the club's about and, and, and what they do and what they don't do and so forth. Then uh, you have number six, you have what we might call property authority. And by property, uh, we, mean, we mean lands, Buildings, houses, cars, uh, and all sorts of other property. So when we all leave here later on, uh, uh, I will go and take my car key and I will go to my car uh, because i got authority over my car. Now, I won't go to your car because I haven't got authority over your car. Vanessa and I were just with friends in the South Island. <laughs> <laughs> we had a rental car, and I have a good look at it. Oh, yeah, white, and it's this. And uh, so we popped into a cafe, and we didn't like it. We came back out again. Let's drive to another one, and let's go somewhere where it's quiet so we can have a conversation. We come out, and I'm trying with the key, and I'm thinking it's not working. I was getting ready to put the key into the lock, and I thought, oh, oh, wrong car. Sorry, guys. Let's go. <laughs> Haven't got authority over this car. I wonder if anybody was watching us. <laughs> but these things can happen. So with buildings, uh, Houses. Uh, see, when I come to your house, uh, and I will only come by invitation, uh, when I come to your house, I will knock on the door. Why do I knock on the door? Because I haven't got authority to barge my way in there. I can only go in there by invitation. And sometimes uh, when people come uh, to our door, to our house, uh, certain people, I don't let them in the front door. I will engage with them briefly at the front step there, and then the conversation is finished, and they go home again, or they move on and knock on another door. It's all about authority. All right. That's why a, a, a thing called home invasion is, is such a wicked thing because somebody does not understand authority and wants to, you know, barges their way in uh, and, and wreak havoc or steal or whatever they do or break ins. And that's all about authority, isn't it? All right. So it's understanding these things as basic as what that is, what we are discussing here. Let me tell you. There are many people in society that have no clue about what we're talking about today. And a little bit later on, I'm going to make up some wrap-up statements. We could do away with most of society's problems if we understood and acted according to the truths uh, that we're bringing here today. <laughs> All right, so property authority. Then you've got church authority. Uh, when the church was first launched uh, on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, um, and, uh, and uh, we know that the Bible tells us that Christ is the head of the church. Who is in charge? Well, primarily and in the first instance, Christ is the head of the church. Tells us that in Ephesians, tells us that in Colossians and various other places in the New Testament. And then the Bible tells us that when Christ ascended on high, this is Ephesians chapter 4. We're not looking at the scriptures, I'm just quoting the references. Uh, and I must confess, sometimes when I put these references there, you know, some diligent people will study that out during the week and say, well, let me have a look at that. And others just, you know, don't bother. But sometimes I put those references there for my own self because it could be three, four, five years. Uh, and when I teach on authority again, I go back uh, and recapture all the hours of 
research uh, and Bible study to be able to refine things and present it in, in a better way the next time around. So, so uh, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 that uh, when Christ ascended on high after his resurrection, when he finally left earth and he went to heaven to be seated at the right hand of the Father, it says that he gave gifts unto men. What are those gifts? The apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. They are the primary leaders in the local church. All right. Uh, so spiritually, obviously, Christ is the head. He's, he's fully in charge of the church, and he communicates with the ministers, and the ministers are being assisted by elders and deacons and various other, whatever you call these people uh, uh, in different churches. You know, different churches, different denominations use different terms for different things. Uh, and uh, and uh, a lot of that seems very simple, but a lot of it is still, according to church government, not fully understand, understood across the board. So, so that's church authority. Uh, and then finally, you have spiritual authority. Uh, we will call that the authority of the believer. That is its own subject and its own study, and we should probably pick that up again at some point in the future because we need to understand that as a believer, if you are a believer, you have authority multiple applications. You've got authority to use the name of Jesus Christ. With the name of Jesus, you have authority to cast out devils. With the name of Jesus, you can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You know, we, we are authorized uh, to use the name of Jesus Christ in everyday life. Then we authorize to come before the throne of grace. Is it Hebrews chapter 4 speaks about the throne of God's grace, but we don't come in our own name. We come in the name of Jesus Christ. You see, the name of Jesus is like the key that un unlocks, uh, you know, opens up access to these spaces that otherwise we could not do. Then furthermore, we have got authority in the earth. When we pray, things happen. Uh, and we are praying. And for the last, uh, you know, my prayer life's gone to a whole new level since COVID. Uh, uh, it's gone to a whole new level. And I'm now praying bolder prayers than I've ever prayed before. And, uh, and some of you, if you would hear what I'm praying, what I'm praying largely in private, because, you know, certain things that you pray, it requires a certain level of spiritual maturity to understand my heart in the middle of all of that. If somebody picks up the wrong end of the stick and they start shooting off in all directions about remove this one and do that and do that, as I say, you know, so certain things that we pray uh, in private, uh, we're praying very bold prayers and I'm very confident we're going to get our nation back, let me tell you that. All right, we're not going to have the devil have his way. We're not going to have the liberals uh, shut us down and hinder us from preaching the gospel. Uh, we're just not going to let it happen. We're praying. We're praying strong prayers. And in the last election, my goodness, there was a removing of a lot of wicked people and a reducing of po wicked political parties, and I'm praying that they be further reduced because some of them not only needed to be removed, some of them needed to be punished for what they've done to the population. Many things that the people don't remember, but I got a long memory, let me tell you that. All right, I don't forget in a hurry, and we must make sure that it'll never be allowed to happen again. You know, what do they say amongst the returned soldiers? They say, lest we forget. Let's not forget what they've done. Uh, and when I'm looking back today, I say, how did we let them do all of that? But anyway, praise God. Um, praise God. Spiritual authority. So we are praying. And, uh, <laughs> and in, Matthew, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus speaking to his disciples and speaking to us too, he says, I give you power and authority over all the power of the enemy. And you cast out devils and, you know, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Spiritual authority. All right, so the question then we might ask, or I would, uh, it says, why did God put all of this authority structure in place? What is really the benefit of all of that? Do we really, really need it? Because there are, and I indicated last week, there are people in, in the earth today, uh, in the world, who would uh, follow a particular philosophy called uh, anarchism. Uh, they do not believe in any form of of authority, full stop. All right, anarchism. Uh, now, where they come from and what planet they're from, I do not know. But uh, why did God set authority structures in place? Well, I want to read three scripture passages uh, to arrive at an answer uh, 
to that question, and I believe it'll help us to capture things a bit better. Three passages of Scripture, and then I want to do a wrap-up uh, of that particular portion of the message so that we can really clench this thing. Number one, we want to uh, speak here about God's supreme and ultimate authority. Deuteronomy 4, verse 40. God says, you shall therefore keep his, meaning God's statutes and his commandments, uh, which I command you today. So this is, I guess this is Moses uh, relaying the information that he received on the mountain from God directly. He's now presented to the nation of Israel. And he says in not so many words, hey guys, the ultimate authority has spoken to us. This is what God commands us to do. And he says, let's keep his commandments. Let's keep his statutes. Statutes are certain regulations uh, uh, and so forth. He says that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord your God is giving you for all time. Everybody say, for all time. Uh, it presents an opportunity uh, for me to quickly make a comment that is completely unrelated to what we're talking about. But people say, who does the land belong to? Uh, when they talk about Palestine, who does the land belong to? Well, uh, the Bible calls the land Israel, calls it the promised land, and God has promised that whole area to Abraham, reaffirmed that to Isaac, and reaffirmed it to Jacob and to the whole nation of Israel. And when they were in slavery in Egypt, God says, I'll bring you out, and I'll bring you into the promised land, what people now call today Palestine. Uh, and, uh, and people say, who does that land belong to? Well, God's given it to the Israelites. Uh, and in the latter part of Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 40, he says, the land which the Lord your God is giving you for all time. Oh, that's all I'm going to say. I might come back to that message at some point because there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of confused people around. And a lot of young people are so confused. They don't know their history. They don't know what's going on today. And they have no idea what's coming. And they're the ones that are standing up for Hamas and, and against Israel. It's just a lot of nonsense going around. And it, like you think, how can intelligent people be so deceived? But you see, deception is a real thing. So anyway, God's authority. Number two, domestic authority. Speaking about the father and the mother. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, it tells children, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise. It's not the first commandment overall, but it's the first commandment that has a promise attached to it. If you do this, you will get that. He says, uh, the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. What's the deal here? The Bible tells children uh, to obey their parental authority. Father and mother have authority over the children. The trouble is young children have no idea that that's what it says in the word. So the responsibility is actually more on the parents. <laughs> to communicate that to the children and to create the rules and then enforce the rules. Is that what authority is? Creating rules and enforcing the rules. Uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, and uh, so number three, we are speaking about governmental authority now. Uh, Romans chapter 13, verse 1 through to verse 4, it says, Let every person be subject to the governing authority authorities. Uh, what are they? Well, governing authorities, there is uh, kings, there's governors and so forth, for there is no authority except from God. See, authority comes from God. God is the authority, and he has delegated certain people, created certain um, spheres of influence, even certain offices, the office of a king, the office of a priest, the office of a, of a, of a father uh, in, in the home. We might call some of these offices, their spaces where authority is to be exercised from, um, but it needs to be done in accordance with God's wisdom, not from you know, world's wisdom. So it says, there's no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted 
by God. So where does authority come from? It comes from God. Now, if somebody abuses authority, that's not from God, but authority itself is from God. Uh, therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to, uh, to good conduct, but to the bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Um, that do, uh, then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. Um, but if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Now, three areas of authority to answer the question, why did God put authority in place? And the answer is right here, that all of those authority stru structures are set up, and we've got four, five points here, letter A, that it may go well with you and with your children after you. God's put authority in there for the well-being of people, all right, for you and your children after you. Um, then uh, that's in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 40. It says that you may prolong your days in the land. Uh, and actually, the reason why Israel was carted off into captivity in the Old Testament, the Bible speaks about it, because they began to disobey God consistently. So in the end, uh, uh, you know, in the end, they, they were carted off. And, uh, and, and, and so uh, while we obey God and do what's right, uh, people sometimes talk about an enduring democracy or an enduring nation that has endured and endured and endured. And the reason why it has endured is because God's wisdom has been applied. And as soon as God's wisdom goes out the window and philosophies come in, Marxism, communism, liberalism, and all of that other nonsense, guess what? That nation is in decline. All right? So, so God has put authority in place for the good of the people, he says in letter C that it may go, it may go well with you. Uh, children, obey your parents that it may go well with you. If children disobey uh, their parents and they do so consistently, it won't go well with them. All right? So, and in letter D, that you may live long on the earth. You see, long life is not just a matter of making good decisions in terms of lifestyle and exercise and nutrition. It's making good decisions in dealing with authorities uh, so we're not resisting uh, authorities because it will shorten our lives according to what I'm seeing here. But if we deal with, with authorities around us, right, it will lengthen our life. That's what God says here, that you may live long on the earth. And then he, uh, letter E, which is speaking about the rule of the government, official, if you like, is God's servant, for your good, all right, for your good. Why did God put authorities in place? For our good. Everybody got that? It's for our good. You see, every authority structure, that is in point five, and it's in your outline, every authority structure that God has set up is for our good, not for the good of the authority structure itself. You think about that. God hasn't set up the authority structure so the authority structure can feel good in its own self. It is set up for the good of others, not for the good of the authority structure itself. And there's multiple, as I say, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, various areas of authority, if we respond right to it, uh, then it will work for us. And if we don't respond right to uh, towards it, it will work against us. As he said, if you do wrong, uh, you know, the ruler does not bear the sword in vain. He will come after you. <laughs> okay, so governmental authority, police uh, force, uh, judges, courts, correctional facilities, and on and on and on goes the list. Now, here is a word to parents, uh, and we are uh, wrapping up very shortly. Here's a word to parents. Um, parents, there are two main things that your children must know. Now, children need to know a lot of things, 
And it's like parents do forever. Repeat, repeat every day, teaching children, teaching, training them, training them up in the nurture and in the admonition. But two things they must know. Number one, they must know that you love them. And number two, and it's in your outline, they must know that they are not in charge. You are. Okay? Last week we talked about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God put it into the garden alongside the tree of life. See, the, 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 the tree of life is, is, is God's love uh, for humanity. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there's simply one word written over it, no. You will not partake of this. The day you do, something terrible is going to happen. We discussed that extensively last week. And your children at an early age need to know the word no. No is a rule. And if, if the no is not obeyed, it needs to be enforced. Now, sometimes people just, anything the child wants, anything, they get anything they want. And if they, if they want something and the parent says no, then the kids throw a wobbly and they're, oh, let's give it to them just for peace sake. You will get an immediate peace, but you will get long-term trouble. Is everybody right with that? It seems like, like some of you are like, <laughs> okay. Uh, no. Uh, and in some homes, uh, parents leave it until the child is five years old, 10, 12, you know, various stages. Or when they go to school, that's when we start clamping down on them. Uh, I would recommend that children need to know within the first few months, certainly within the first year and the latter part, what the word no means, and it needs to be enforced. And when you say no, the child needs to know that you're the authority, not the child. <laughs> it's uh, very basic, I know, but uh, as I say, um, if we teach children to respect and to obey parental authority, which is the initial and primary authority that they encounter, then they will not have any trouble respecting and honoring authority structures that they will encounter when they go through life as children, school, children's church, you know, then later on and they get into adulthood, authority police, and authorities that are people that are directing certain areas and so forth. But the parental authority is the initial, the primary and the first authority. And if we as parents fail to teach them to obey that authority, they will bump into every other authority structure beyond that. And then you got people, you got grown men uh, that are in correctional facilities and say, oh gosh, what went wrong? So, and, and these places are needed. Uh, and, uh, but somewhere, for having these places filled with people, we need to take a bit of responsibility as a society today. And how can we do better? What can we do better in the home? And how can we do this better? You see, we've got children in our spaces right now, children's church and everything else, every one of them is loved, every one of them is appreciated, I visit them every Sunday, uh, I love your kids, I love every single one of them, but we got a few rebels out there, <laughs> and you're their parent, <laughs> and they're out of control, and it is not our job as a church, and it is not the job of our children's church people to train your kids, that is your job, use the word no and then enforce it. <laughs> How basic can parenting be? <laughs> okay. I think I might move on right now. Some of you are like, uh... <laughs> See, it all begins in the home. All begins in the home. And if I had more time, if I had more time, I would get into some of the laws that government has created that is meddling with the families with the home, anti-smacking law. And, uh, and people that have only had girls 
you know, daughters and no boys say, yeah, no, you don't need to smack children. Well, wait until you get boys, okay? <laughs> wait until you get boys. And of course, nowadays, it's not allowed anymore. So it's government meddling with the family, with the basic structure. And we've got a societal problem going on across the board. And that is just one law. They said it was going to, it was going to fix uh, child abuse. But it hasn't fixed it. We knew it wasn't going to fix it. We knew it was a stupid law. And now we have it. And now good parents are being criminalized. It's like, what's up with that? So that's called government overreach. When government reaches and begins to meddle with the family, they say, we're going to fix something. And say, well, no, you haven't fixed it. You made it worse. Of course, child abuse needs to be you know, brought to justice and needs to stop. But that's not the way to do it. They need to find another method. So it all begins in the home. It all starts in the home. <laughs> and you don't wait until you've got an 18-year-old, 16-year-old, 14-year-old rebel on your hands. It's a bit late at that point. Start early. You know what? I feel a, a, a parenting course coming on pretty soon, actually. <laughs> because these things are not that easy, you understand. Uh, as I say, we've run parenting courses over the years, and we better bring that on again uh, because we've got a few rebels out there in the children's church. So, praise God. <laughs> All right. Is everybody having fun? I'm having fun. I want you to enjoy this as well, okay? <laughs> a word to all of us um, as a people, as a society. Letter E in your outline. If the above stated truths about authority were understood and adhered to in today's society, we could drastically reduce various social services. We could drastically reduce the police presence. Because if people know that laws are there, we don't need any enforcers going around. Uh, and because we, we can drastically reduce all of that. We could reduce judicial services, as in courts up and down the country that are clogged out with cases after case after case. And a lot of it is dealing with people, individual groups or families that don't understand what we're discussing. All right? Uh, doing away with legal services. And my goodness, you know, we got lawyers, and I'm, all you lawyers out there, I'm not against you. I'm absolutely for you. I'm not trying to take your job away. But, but a lot of these things could be drastically reduced uh, uh, if only that issue of authority, that concept was understood and practiced. A lot of government departments that have been created to bring, you know, social services, what they call wraparound services, uh, just throw more money at something, let's fix the problem. Money does not fix the problem. It's good to have money. But I was talking to a, a politician some time back, a couple of years ago, and I said, look, uh, we, we do what we can as a church to provide as much services out into the community. But in certain families, it's a generational thing. There is... Lack of wisdom in one generation passed on to the next generation. And in the generation, God's wisdom is just not there. So the, unless you add an educational component into this thing, and this is the thing, it's not the government's job to educate us. It is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that God has placed into society to bring God's wisdom so that uh, we can have a better society. Society is broken because the family is broken. If you want to fix society, we must fix the family. Is everybody all right this morning? <laughs> okay. Uh, praise God. That's probably all I'm, uh, uh, I need to say for now. I think I'm done. <laughs> we have some scripture passages there that it's in your outline that just basically bears out some more of the truths that we've already discussed and so forth. But I trust that, uh, uh, you know, this is something that uh, we can carry away ourselves and we're invited. We can bring some of that wisdom into places and spaces where things just aren't working. And the reason why the things are not working in certain areas uh, in, in society because God's wisdom is not understood. Thank you. Thanks for watching Victory Christian Center. For more content, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or you can subscribe to our podcasts on Spotify, iTunes or Google Podcasts. Check out our website at victory.net.nz. We'll see you again soon.